Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. Well, good morning. Please uh, grab your Bibles, open them up to where we left off two weeks ago, which is Luke chapter 9, and we will pick things up in verse 7. And I'll be reading Luke 9, 7 through 17 uh, this morning. Now Herod the Tetrarch heard of all that was done by him, meaning Jesus, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead and by some that Elijah had appeared and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. Herod said, John, I have beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? So he sought to see him. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. Then he said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of fifty. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and twelve baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading from his word this morning. You may be seated. All right. So this is the, what did I, is it, um, John, 29 or 39? 29, yeah, it's the 29th message in the series. It's amazing to think about it, and we're not even, we're going to be about halfway through chapter 9 today. And so um, there's just so much that is contained within Luke's writing of the life and ministry of, of Christ. And so um, two weeks ago, so last week we're at family camp, so two weeks ago, we considered um, how Jesus had sent out his 12 apostles in order for them to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God throughout, if you would, the villages of Israel. Um, And when he sent them out, he sent them out by giving them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And so they went out for a period of time, um, and then they came back to him, and they were excited about what's going to happen. The next thing we see happening then is going to be what we're going to look at today, but it's kind of, it's interwoven, but it's going to be another miracle of Christ that gives further attestation to his messianic ministry. I mean, he's going to do something for well over 5,000 people, we'll talk about that number in a little bit, well over 5,000 people, that it's going to be, who else can do this? In fact, it's going to be something that John um, in his gospel shares, John chapter 6, that Jesus coming and talking about being the bread of life and comparing himself to the manna in the wilderness and that kind of stuff. And so uh, a huge um, messianic statement that's going to go on. But there's going to be, um, in this, we're going we're gonna, to, as we look at it, we want to look at two sub-themes that really are going to deal with two people groups. That are, that are here, and so I've got circles around these people groups. The first people group is the crowd, okay? And we're going to look at this, this mindset of the Messiah, the mindset of Jesus. And then the second group are the disciples, because Jesus is, is going to be working this miracle. I don't think it's the miracle is just for the people. I think the miracle is for his disciples. They think they're, he's trying to teach them something as well. And so those are the kind of little sub-themes that, that I want to look at. So as we're going to look 
this major thing. We've heard of the, the feeding of the 5,000. We talk about the feeding of the 5,000. It's a marvelous thing. But I, I want, again, this is old hat kind of stuff. It's like teaching the choir, right? You know, everybody's heard this. You guys could teach it to the, you know, to the kids. You could probably tell it to the, the people that you meet on the street about the, the feeding of the 5,000. And so as we look at it, though, to look at it with fresh eyes, considering the things that Jesus is teaching within the midst of this. And for me... Um, the book of Philippians, so like Brian shared in, in testimony time, Colossians 1 is an is, um, important uh, chapter for him. The book of Philippians as a whole is, is probably what God used early in Bob's life. That was the first book that I memorized um, of his word, and so it's been the longest germinating in my life as far as processing over and over again. And there are so much from the book of Philippians that for Bob, just... You, if you know me long enough, you just kind of see it. It's, it's that God uses it. In Philippians chapter 2, um, Paul begins by talking about the unity of the saints. And if there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of the Spirit, you know, all these things. But let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, right? So we have this verse 1, verse 5. Well, verse 2 to 4 kind of flows in between those, right? Kind of makes sense. And so he's talking about wanting them to have a same mind. Uh, unity of spirit, if you would. And he says, if there be any strife, if there be any vainglory, um, let's see, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem better than themselves. Look not every man on his own thing, but every man on the things of others. Let this mind be in you. Well, what? That mind I just talked about. And it was the mindset of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. For me, this miracle moment, if you would, this moment demonstrates, highlights the mindset of Christ. Because as we're going to come into this, Jesus begins by, um, or we, we're told by Luke, that there is this certain situation that is going to happen here, okay? And it begins with this statement of a desire by Jesus to take his disciples away. Now, we're going to talk about that in, in just a moment, but first, I want you to go back to Matthew chapter 4. So if you have your Bible, turn back to Matthew 4. In Matthew 4, we have, I'm sorry, not Matthew 4, Matthew 14. In Matthew 14, we have um, Matthew's version of this. And so we read beginning at verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus. So Luke shares us about this, a little bit about Herod, and says to his servants, this is John the Baptist, he has risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had said to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore, he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oath and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. That's pretty gross, isn't it? But that's what happened. And she brought it to her mother. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Next line. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, the hour is late, so on and so forth. Now we go back into Luke, right? So, Matthew shares a detail about the life of Jesus that Luke doesn't necessarily share at this moment. Who was John to Jesus? His cousin. His cousin. Distant cousin, hardly ever knew him, is that true? No, it's not true. It's not a true statement. How far apart are they birth order? Six months. Six months. When was the first time they ever met? In the womb. Good job. That's exactly right. In the womb. Before they were born, 
John is leaping for joy at the presence of Mary. And Jesus is a zygote. Ah, it's mind-boggling to me. But in the womb, they fellowship. Isn't that kind of cool? And then we don't know the rest of the next 30 years. We just know when, when Jesus comes and begins his earthly ministry, he begins it by coming to John. And John recognizes him, right? And we know from John chapter 1, so the Apostle John's gospel, right? And he says, he's talking about John the Baptist, and he says that John the Baptist declared, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he tells Jesus, he says, No, man, you, I... I I need to be immersed by you. I need to be baptized by you, not you by me. And Jesus says, no, no, we have got to do this for, for to fulfill all righteousness. So they knew each other well. This is a, a, huge for me because, again, Jesus is God. He says to the Father in John 17, he says, glorify me now with the glory that I had with you in the beginning. Okay, so it wasn't Jesus was born and then he had these days on earth and now he is. But Jesus declares that he was with the Father, I and the Father are one, right? That he was with the Father in the beginning, before the creation was ever made. Because we know from John chapter 1, in him all things were made and without him nothing was made that was made, right? So, so he's God. And yet here he is, in his earthly, if you would somehow, cousin, half cousin, however you look at it, because it's really not by blood total, right? Dies, and Jesus is disturbed. He's bothered. He has what? Emotions. He has emotions. When he goes to Lazarus and Lazarus dies, we read the shortest verse in the entire Bible. What? Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And there's a part where Jesus wants to just get away. He'd gotten this note that John was beheaded. I, I, I believe it didn't take him by surprise. He probably knew it. He knew before the foundations of the world were laid what was going to happen. And yet when it happened, it was like a gut punch. And he just wanted to get away. And so you have this, this, this time, uh, desire, if you would, um, intent for a respite, just to get away, a time of rest. But it was also then going to be a retreat, if you would, for his disciples. Because as Luke says, the disciples had now come back, and they were excited about everything that had happened. And so Jesus, kind of like the president, he's going to take the, the cabinet, and they're going to go to Camp David. You know, They're going to go off, and they're going to spend their time away. Have you ever had moments where you just want to get away? I mean, you just feel like, I need downtime. I need to just set aside. Do you ever have a time when you say, I'm going to have this downtime and I'm setting it apart, and then someone decides to come visit you just as you're getting ready to have that downtime? Or you go camping, and sure enough, there's so-and-so out there camping with you. and You get where I'm going with that, right? When an interruption comes and it messes up your plans, well, that's the next thing we see. We see the interruption. Because the people loved Jesus. They wanted to hear Jesus. They wanted to see miracles. They had all these things that were going on. And so they saw Jesus with the 12, and they saw him take off, probably in the boat, across the water, okay, cutting across the the northern end of the Sea of Galilee. And we're told they knew where he was going. Jesus was predictable. In fact, so predictable that Judas was able to tell the, the folks there at um, the, the temple that we can just go down to the garden over there in Gethsemane and we'll find him because he was always going to go there and what? Pray. So apparently Jesus must have gone to the deserted spot near Bethsaida in the past as a, a, a way of just getting away from the crowds and that kind of stuff, and someone has discovered it. And so when he's taking off, someone probably says what? 
hey, he's going over to the, to the desert spot. You know, let's, let's go over. And so all these people, I, I, Chuck, you guys go went Northern Galilee. See, were you there, Steve? Northern, uh, yeah. quite a while ago. And uh, anyways, I've been there. And, and I, and, and I, I kind of try to imagine all these people running. Because the, these guys are going across the, 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 the top of the, if you would, the lake. Okay, going across the, the lake to the spot. Because, but we're told that when Jesus gets there, they're already there waiting on him. And so they got to go around the thing. They're, these guys are cutting across by boat. These guys are running around. I don't know how long it took for them to, you know, all these guys to be oaring the boat over. But could you imagine all this crowd running? Did Jesus kind of see them on the edge? <laughs> There's kind of like a, this race going on, you know, who's going to get there first? We're told when Jesus gets there, he doesn't shoo them off. Do you get it? He has a, another purpose. He has another design. He wants to get away. He needs time alone. That's amazing to think about. But when he gets there, there are well over 5,000 people waiting on him. I would have said, let's go back over this way and go further over here. Make sense? I would have taken it a further distance because clearly our deserted spot isn't what? Deserted anymore. Jesus didn't do that. Say it again. Get louder, buddy. Yeah, because Jesus was going to the shore. And so they were on the shore and they ran all around the shore to the other side. They didn't come across the water. They went around the shore and beat him. Yeah, it was. It's exactly right. It was amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so, so it's the mind of Christ, right? So, I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing. Jesus sat there and, and he came down to be with them. Instead of saying, we're going to change directions. I would have changed directions. That's sad to say. That's honest. Okay? And so... Jesus didn't. Jesus saw the crowd, and he knew that their needs were more important than his needs. Their value was more important than his value. Philippians chapter 2. That's the mind of Christ. He looked on the people, and what we're told from Matthew is he looked upon them with compassion. Compassion. In Philippians chapter 2, when it says, Nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but let every man also on the things of others. It talks about, in verse 1, if there be any consolation in Christ, if there be any compassion, right? The word there is the word splankitsomai, okay? And so, I don't think I put it up here. Yeah, I didn't. So, the decision. Um, because it's hard to see anyway. But it's where we get our word spleen from. The splinket so And it's, it's feeling something in your gut, down in. Okay, so it's not just, you know, when we talk about something, you, know, you feel it way down in, that's what it is. And so Jesus looked upon these people, and he had a great compassion for them. So what did he do? He received them. The first thing we're told literally is he decomied them. He received them. He welcomed them. In. Hey guys, I'm so glad you came. We say it, and what? We're thinking inside. Why are you here? <laughs> exactly right. Jesus meant it. He received them. He received them with gladness, I believe. And again, he set in an example, not just for these people, but I think he set in an example for. His disciples. Undoubtedly, some one of his disciples, I don't know which one, maybe more of them, were probably saying, based upon all these other things that they say, right? Lord, send them away. I mean, this was supposed to be our time. Did you ever think that too? This is supposed to be my time? This is supposed to be our time? Send them away? He didn't do it. He received them. Second thing he did was he taught them. He taught them the kingdom of God. And so he received them, but he received it for a purpose. 
he knew that this was an opportunity for a teaching moment. They came to hear the word, and he wasn't going to allow the moment go away. I had someone recently ask me about, um, in, lovingly, about being able to tell people no sometimes. And, and I go, I do struggle with that. I do struggle with saying no at times. Um, however, I see it as opportunities to interact with people and to teach God's word. It may cause my, my life to go more hectic. It may cause my hamster wheel to spin a little faster. But the reality is that we're here on earth to minister to people. That's what ministry is. Ministry is people. And so there's opportunities to teach all the time. The question is, do we take the opportunity to teach? Or... Is it like Bob? I want the my time. I want the me time. I'm the introvert, okay? And I, and, and I mean, there are times I just want to go shut down. You know, I want to go hide in my room, you know, do whatever. But I can't. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I do. You're not there at my house when Bob shuts down. Marsha can tell you stories about when Bob just shuts down and he'll just, he'll go off. And it's like, where were you at? It's like, I just needed to power down. I just needed out. But that's selfish. That's me saying, I don't believe God can do what? Give me the stamina and the strength to continue on. Does not make sense? So there's a balance there. I get it. People are going to talk to me about the balance. But there's a part where I have to believe that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not by my own strength. But when I am weak, then he is made strong. Does it make sense? Okay. And so Jesus saw the opportunity. To teach these people. So he did. So he received them and he began to teach them about the kingdom of God. When you have an opportunity, someone interrupts your schedule and you have an opportunity to talk to them, what is it that you want to talk to them about? Steve, I've been blessed by hearing of all your inter interactions with the sauna and stuff like that. It's exciting because, I mean, we know, we've known each other for years now, right? And for me to watch the transformation of, of Steve becoming the, the evangelist, it's just, it's amazing. And, and it's encouraging to me um, to watch God use a guy just used everyday conversations to, to turn him back to the kingdom. And I praise the Lord for that. And I pray for that in my own life. That's why, you know, I said a couple weeks ago um, about when knocking on doors, I never know what the conversation is going to be, and I have no, I have no idea what I'm going to say because I don't know who the people are and what we're going to talk about. So this past Wednesday, I literally got to pray with a woman. I got to encourage her. I got to pray with her. And then literally across the, the double driveways to the next lady was a lady in her 70s who wasn't saved, and I got to stand there for the longest time and give her the gospel. She didn't get saved, but she, she knows what the gospel is right now. And I told her, I, I don't expect necessarily you're going to believe me just because I'm standing at your door, but I encourage you now go back and read your Bible. And if everything I'm telling you is true, and you're convicted by this, because she was, then you need to call upon the name of the Lord. Make sense? But those two houses right next door to each other, two totally different things, and I had no idea. But there was a moment, there was an opportunity to talk about, if you would, the kingdom of God to both, but from different perspectives. Okay? Jesus got to taught the kingdom of God. What's the third thing he did then? He healed them. Okay? He healed them. But specifically he said to those who have a kriya, a need. He didn't wantonly. And I wish I could tell you specifically what this means. I think there's something involved here. They didn't just, it wasn't a wanton. But that he literally saw the individual's needs and he healed as he went. Um. I'm always mindful of the fact of my quiet time this morning, the last couple of days has been on meditating on the lame man um, in Jerusalem. Peter and John heal the lame man and then the, the response to it and the reactions to it and being thrown in jail and all that kind of stuff. But how old, how long had that lame man been lame? Say again? Oh, okay. How, how many years? Anybody have an idea? 40-ish. 40 years. 
And it says that how often was he laid there at that gate? Every day. Say it again louder. Every day. Every day. Did you ever ponder the fact that Jesus passed him by multiple times? Jesus passed him by multiple times. Never healed him. In fact, when Peter says, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk, he doesn't even ask, who's Jesus? He already knows who Jesus is. And he stands up. And I think to myself, okay, Jesus heals the guy who was born blind, but he probably passed that guy multiple times before he did it too. This guy's still sta- sitting at the, the gate for Peter and John to, to do the, the healing. Did he heal everybody within that five? You know, clearly no, not everybody. But even in the 5,000 plus, were there people who left that day who weren't necessarily healed? Potentially. I wish I could understand fully in it, but God knows our what? Our needs. And he meets our needs at the proper time of meeting our needs. And sometimes he allows us to bear with the afflictions. Because he knows that the affliction is what we need at that moment. That's an ouch, isn't it? Say it again. You're right. To give you strength. It causes you to grow. Sometimes if, if, if I didn't have that affliction, I wouldn't be able to trust God. And I'm tur- I turn to God. So he heals them as they had need. Okay, And so, again, we know that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. So there was not a need, if you would, that was there that he couldn't meet. But he did meet it. Okay, So the mindset of Christ. He put aside his own desires. He put aside his own needs for the needs and the desires of other individuals. So I ask myself, do I have the minds of Christ, the mindset of Christ? I can say, well, yeah, some, but do I really fully have it? If you don't, it needs to be a prayer. Lord, help me to have this mind. Help me to have a servant's heart. Help me to be able to, to see the needs of others and to be able to set aside my own desires in order to meet their needs. Jesus, being the very form of God, we're told, then continuing on in Philippians chapter 2, being in the very form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Why? Because he was God. But made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant, a doulos, a bond slave, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fact as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death. Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, I think, is Yahweh, is what it says. Jesus Christ is Lord, and I think Lord there, Adonai, would be Yahweh, because it comes from a prophecy of Isaiah, where Yahweh declares that unto me every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And so Jesus modeled the mindset that he wanted his disciples to walk in. But his disciples are still struggling with it. This is all new to them, as it seems to be to us many times, right? We still struggle. We're still working on it. And so immediately, Jesus does all these things, but it's getting to be now great in the day. The day is wearing on, right? And so it's getting to be dinner time. So the pragmatists, the practical individuals... The systems analysts are all looking out there, and they're logisticizing everything, and they're looking at the crowd. I'm putting it on my hand because it's Bob all over this thing, right? I mean, Bob is looking at the numbers. Bob is ca- calculating behind the scenes how much food we have because somebody's got to do this for Jesus because he's teaching, and he's not thinking about all these things. And so somebody's got to be planning this kind of stuff because these people are going to want to eat, right? And so... So behind the scenes, Bob is doing all the systems and analysis stuff. He's looking to see how much food we have. He's found this little kid who's got, you know, two fish and five loaves of bread and, 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 and trying to figure out, well, man, I, there's no way we can do this. I mean, you know, da-da-da-da-da-da. So the disciples 
they come to Jesus, right? Because we're not going to come to this miracle phase. And the first thing we have is this presentation of the need and request of the disciples. And the disciples come to Jesus. I mean, think about it. They're interrupting the teaching. They're interrupting the interaction. And I don't know how they do this, you know. So, Brian, you're now Jesus. And I don't know if they kind of get around Jesus and kind of do the whisper in the air, the stage aside thing. Hey, Lord, you need to get rid of these people. <laughs> I don't know if you figured this thing out, but there's a lot of people here, Lord. And, and we haven't got any food. They're going to want to eat. And if they're going to eat, they're going to have to start now. I mean, I don't know where we're going to find food for over 5,000 people, right? So they say to the Lord, Lord, send away the people. At first, I want you, I want you to think about this. Is it, is it a practical request? Sure it is. Sure it is. We haven't got food. It's getting to be dinner time. I mean, and so we can, I mean, I can see this literally happening. I'm teaching, I'm oblivious. Let's put it back at family camp last week, right? I'm oblivious, and I'm teaching, and I'm, I'm doing all this kind of stuff. We have the electric power, power outage, right? We came back on for, for that time, but let's say it continued out, right? Well, it doesn't bother Jesus and them because they haven't got the power anyway, but it would bother us, right? And so, so now all of a sudden, someone goes up to the kitchen and finds out the power's out, and they're not able to what? Cook us lunch. And so somebody's going to start thinking what? Where are we going to get food from? I hope they got a plan B, because somebody's stomach's going to start grumbling when, when Bob thinks, well, plan B is I preach longer. I mean, <laughs> there, there's no physical food. I gave you, continue to be able to preach and give you spiritual food. You're fed now, aren't you? Come on. Who, who really wants to have physical food? Yeah, okay. And then we have the whole... <laughs> anyways. <laughs> Everybody has a different plan B. Anyways, but there's going to be someone trying to figure out positively, okay? It could be Brian as the event guy thinking, oh, now what am I supposed to do? You know, Bob's up there teaching. I'm kind of on the hook. What am I going to do? Is he looking now trying to find out what, what can Subway do in a half an hour? Can Subway be sending up 100 subs for us? You know, is he, is he talking to, is there, is that barbecue place, is it still open down there? Do you think that they can, they can slaughter a, a pig and, and cook it up for us all within half an hour? I mean, somebody is behind the scenes starting to process this, right? So it's not fully a negative, except for it is in this moment. Because they're missing something very important that they missed when they were on the boat. What is it? They have Jesus with them. And Jesus is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that they could ever ask or think. Do you get it? So there's a lot of these little parts in the Bible that are just these little boop, boop, boop moments that I just pause and I stop and I laugh at. The next one is one of those. It's Jesus' retort. And I put the word retort there because I often wonder, what's Jesus', I don't say attitude, but you know, when you say something, you can say something that communicates something. And so, Lord, do, we, we need to send these people away. Do you, I mean... Do you understand? I mean, it's getting to be dinner time. Jesus turns around and says what? Feed you feed them. <laughs> can, can you imagine the moment? Can you imagine the moment? These guys are here like, Lord, Lord, Lord. Get out of my way. Feed them. Just feed them. You know? <laughs> and he goes back, you feed them. Could you imagine the expression of his disciples in this moment? It felt significantly, yes. Did he just say what I thought he just said? Lord, were you speaking uh, like English and we don't know English? I mean, can you speak Hebrew to us? Speak Galilean because we just think you just said, <laughs> you feed them. <laughs> well, I, I did, that's what I said. You guys feed them. The response to the disciples. Lord, we only have Five little barley loaves and two small fish. We stole it from a kid. It was his lunch. This isn't looking good anyway. But still, we took this kid's lunch, and that's all we have. And there's all these 5,000 people. Lord, can you imagine? These 5,000 people walked all that distance, and none of them brought lunch. None of them brought any food, Lord. <laughs> and they're expecting us to feed them? And Lord, there is at least... 5,000 men here. Now, again, you need to understand culture. 
they weren't counting the, the woman and the, and the kids. You've got probably at least 7,500 people here. Some will conjecture 10,000, 12,000. I'll go conservative. <laughs> 7,500. That still seems a lot of people. Even if we stuck to men, 5,000 is kind of a lot to come up with food. About this. Make sense? I don't have to really exaggerate that number a whole lot for it to be, whoa, this is amazing, right? And, and they're saying, I got what? Five barley loaves. I know the two fish, that really adds a whole lot to it. Um, <laughs> well, they do have the two fish. Five barley loaves. Do the math. 5,000 guys. We're not even worried about the kids. We're not going to worry. Mean, because you know guys eat more than women anyway. Okay? You women need to figure that out when you're making meals for guys. Okay? Don't, they don't eat like you. They eat a little bit more. So they eat twice as much, let's say, right? Think about it. I've got 5,000 guys. That means I've got five loaves, barley loaves, one barley loaf. Remember, this is a lunch for a kid. So one barley loaf is going to feed how many? A thousand guys. No, well, we're going to just talk about the guys. That's right. Yeah, we're not even talking about the women and the kids. We're talking about, if we're talking about only guys, in the number we're told, 1,000. I can't imagine being one of those 1,000 guys sitting. I mean, think about it. If I had one barley loaf, and there's not even 100 of us here, how many of you are hoping that you're sitting up front? <laughs> start in the back. Start in the back. We always got to start in the back. <laughs> no. Everybody's trying to figure out where is he going to start because I'm not going to get anything left. Make sense? 5,000. Isn't it an amazing thing? What Jesus did at that moment, this is what the guys are seeing. They're looking at it through our eyes. They're not looking at it through the eyes of Christ and what God can do. Jesus is setting up the moment in order for his disciples to yet again understand the power that is available to those who believe in Christ. I'm not saying that, that I repeat this miracle on my own. But I do believe I could repeat that miracle if it was God's will for me. If in a moment he stuck me in a position like this, that it was something that he could do, not that I could do. Because think about this provision of the need. The first thing we have... <laughs> is the specifics of the, the miracle, which we've kind of talked about. We have just five loaves, two fish, but then you have the agents of the miracle. Jesus doesn't walk around and feed the people. Jesus doesn't take the five loaves and do the, 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 um, the magic thing, right? And, and put the, the, the little, um, come on, curtain kind of thing over it and go, boom, and all of a sudden, boom, and there it is. And then he's handing out all this kind of stuff. Make sense? And everybody sees all this bread. It doesn't happen that way. What does he do? Well, first thing is give thanks. Good. That's important. I'm leaving that out. But yes, that's, he gives thanks to the Lord to make sure that everybody understands where it's coming from. But then the agents of it, he breaks the bread, and he gives it probably to ten, and then he probably gives the fish to one each of the, of the disciples. That's what we read, that he breaks the bread, gives to his disciples. So I'm thinking there's 12 disciples, he probably did it that way. That's a math thing. Anyways, so however that plays out, now I'm one of the disciples. How much bread do I have? A half a loaf. Whew, that's a good, now I only have to feed 500 with it. <laughs> I've just divided how many people I've got to feed. Now I have, only have to feed 500. Think about this. Who are the ones, who are the ones that the people are going to see feeding them at this moment? The disciples. Jesus is standing back. The ones who are in the mind of the people performing the miracle are the disciples. How are you continually, what? Causing that half a loaf become more. I want you to think about that. 
If Jesus would have done the, 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 the magician thing, everybody would have seen Jesus did it. But Jesus takes the loaves just as they are, splits them in half, gives them to the disciples, and tell them, now go feed them. They just told him what? We can't do it. We, we don't have enough. Jesus says, I want you to do it. You're going to what? You're going to feed them. You feed them. So here you go. Here's your half a loaf. Now what? Go feed them. And so the agents of the miracle are these guys who just moments ago didn't believe it could be done. And yet, the magnitude of the miracle was, at the end, they didn't just feed the people, but they what? They filled up 12 baskets of leftovers. There was more bread left over than they started with. Did you ever think about that? There was more bread left over than what they even started with. And everybody was full, satisfied. Yeah, I wonder what satisfied means, right? <laughs> they were, I think they were full. I think they were content. They, were, they had eaten. Make sense? Now, they might not have eaten a lot thinking, oh, well, there's only half a bread. You know. Could you imagine the first person who's going to grab off that thing? Knowing that I got 4,999 more men who are going to be... <laughs> Anyways. Or when that first guy went in to grab it, did he grab it off of a, a full loaf? Did that half a loaf become the loaf by the time that guy took the basket? And when it got passed to the next guy, was it a full loaf again? You ever wonder how that played out? Yeah. All the time. Every time, I read the story. every time I read the story. Every time. I mean, because like, people are sitting there looking. And they never see it. The widow with her oil. Do you ever wonder if she peeked in that jar <laughs> trying to figure out where's that oil coming from? I just keep pouring, keep pouring, and more oil keeps coming, more oil keeps coming, more oil keeps coming. And now all of a sudden I got my last pan and I'm trying to figure out what am I going to continue to do because I'm down to my last pan. And what happens? It runs out. When God does a miracle, God does it His way, but in a, a very powerful way. But what's important to me here is, again, these sub-themes that he's teaching to the people that are there. They see something that they cannot... I mean, could you imagine being there that day and going and telling other people about it? He did what? All I can just tell you, there was like 5,000 guys, you know, all the wise kids, that kind of stuff. Maybe there's 7,500, maybe there's 10,000. I don't know. There was a lot of people there that day. And I promise you that all he had down there when he thanked Yahweh was five loaves. I mean, we're talking about a kid's lunch, dude. I mean, that's, what, that's all they had to feed us. And we all ate and ate and ate until we were satisfied. And then they wanted to collect all the leftovers. Where did, all, I mean, where did the leftovers come from? That means that people must have been eating and having it while it's still being passed around, that they could come back through and collect leftovers. I don't know if you think about this stuff, but I think about it all the time. And, and, and all I can tell you is that when they were done, there were 12 leftovers. We still could have been eating. I thought, oh, I don't know if I could eat any more. But, oh, I guess I could because there was more. But could you imagine the disciples that day? Could you imagine being one of the disciples? I wanted to shoo the people away. <laughs> and had you had done it, you would have failed to have been blessed by one of the greatest miracles that we know in the scriptures. And I wonder to myself, how many times do I miss the blessing because I'm shooing people away? Because I want me time. And I don't want the time, if you would. I don't want to see what God's getting ready to do. I just want to spend it on me. Interruptions. How do you view them? How do you respond 
when people interrupt your plans. It's really the key. It really goes back to the beginning. Jesus met it with an opportunity to serve. Jesus met it with an opportunity to minister to other people. Do you consider then the needs of others as being more important than your own? Do you have a servant's heart? If not, are you willing to ask for it? Again, we talked about at family camp, praying and praying according to the, the will of the Father. And if you ask anything according to his will, you know that he hears you, First John 5. And you know that if he hears you, you have that thing which you ask for because he'll give it to you, right? I promise you, if you ask God to help you have the mind of Christ, Philippians chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If you say, Father, I want that mind, that's according to his will. So, rejoice in the Lord, always pray without ceasing, in everything, what? Give thanks, why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus, okay? So you're told to do these things, well, it's also the will of God in Christ Jesus for you to have his mind, to be conformed to his image and likeness. So if, if, you, if you struggle in the area, and I promise you, Bob struggles, and Bob prays for this, okay? So if you struggle in that area, you need to pray for it, okay? And God will help you, Okay? God helps me, okay? There are times I serve, but I'm not necessarily inside wanting to serve. But I know that if I do it, my mind will change. Does that make sense? I, and I will, I will be blessed because of what I've done, okay? And so that's the point where I've gotten to. I've gotten to at least that. And there are some points where I enjoy serving, but I promise you there's sometimes I don't enjoy serving. So don't, don't ever say, oh, Bob's not enjoying that, so I don't want to do it. Don't do that to me, okay? I'm just being honest with you. I'm being genuine, okay? And so, but there are parts when Bob's going to do things, not necessarily because he wanted to right off the bat, but because I want to serve Christ, and I want to serve people, and I, and I want to be able to do what he wants me to do. And I know that in the end, I will have the enjoyment and the blessing that comes from doing it. Does it make sense? Um, yeah, so pray for it. How do you respond when God gives you a task that seems to be beyond your capabilities? Go feed 5,000 people with five loaves, two fish. That's a Bible story, Lord. <laughs> uh, I think you did it, but I don't think you're going to do it today. Really? Now, it may not be this. It could be something else. But God may ask you to do something that's outside your comfort zone and beyond what you believe that you can do in and of yourself. Good. That's when God takes over. If you are asked to do something that's beyond you, then you can know that it's Christ who what? Strengthens you. That's exactly right. Is there then a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the testimony of how you worked in this moment through the disciples, teaching them, Lord, as well, your heart's desire, and that is to serve others. Lord, you met needs. You met their need by teaching them the word. You met their need by healing them, but then you met their need by feeding them. Lord, help us to have minds that are looking toward the needs and the values of others as being more important than our own. And Lord, I pray that we would be then of faith. Um, where if you told us to move a mountain, be cast into the sea, Lord, that we would believe that you'd want it done and we would do it. Whether we understood the fullness of it or not, that by, by faith and by obedience, we would we would do those things which you've called us to do. Lord, I do ask um, that you would help us to be this light in this community so that in, that, in light of what we're talking about and the feeding of the 5,000s and the community and, and that's around us, Lord, I pray that we would be those ones who would see the needs and we would want to feed um, uh, with the kingdom of God those that are surrounding us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.